Hello everyone, this is Fire Chief Paul Dow with Albuquerque Fire Rescue. Now this podcast is designed to bring you helpful training and best practices and some additional resources that you can access from anywhere. So thank you for joining us and enjoy today's episode. Welcome uh, to another exciting podcast uh, with Albuquerque Fire Rescue. I'm joined today with a uh, special guest, uh, Dr. Matt Gunderson. He is an attending uh, physician at uh, UNM Hospital uh, and he specializes in pediatrics. And by the way, I'm your host today, uh, Lieutenant John McGee. So uh, first things first, Dr. Gunderson, uh, what do you think about all this snow we've had over the past couple of days? Yeah, I'm loving it. I'm uh, I'm from Utah, and I have a Jeep, and so I was kind of this morning going out of my way to find snowdrifts to drive through and <laughs> that was everything. You? So yeah, so yeah, so you might find me. You guys might have to respond to me off the side of the road at okay. some point in time. But uh, I'm loving it. So right it's been great. Yeah. yeah, we don't get much of it. I mean, you're you're from Utah, so you're you're used to big snow. Uh huh. Yes. We get yeah. four or five inches, and it's a big deal. Yeah. This is yeah yeah. So I, I'm enjoying every single snowflake out right there. On. Well, thanks for joining us today, and um. You know, our, our topic today is going to be specifically pediatric seizures. But before we get into it, um, how about telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, you bet. I, uh, so I'm from Utah. I went to medical school at the University of Utah, stayed in state. Um, and then I did residency in uh, general pediatrics uh, down in Arizona. And then I subspecialized in pediatric emergency medicine uh, here at uh, the University of New Mexico. Um, just kind of continued my little, I guess, circle around the Four Corners area as I kind of came around. Um, and then, uh, so I finished that last year and uh, UNM hired me on as an attending physician in the pediatric emergency department. And I've been working there for about half a year. Um, it's going good so far, um, at least for me. I don't know, UN, UNM hasn't said anything. So <laughs> maybe, maybe they're uh, having buyer's remorse, I don't know. Job. I guess that's yeah, a good sign. Yeah, yes, yes, exactly. Uh, okay, so I know this is a broad topic. Right. And uh, for frontline providers, you know, pre-hospital for us, this is a scary thing right, to encounter. It's a pediatric seizure. You know, it's even though, you know, physiologically kids are pretty much the same. We don't look at it the same. Right. Yeah. We, we, we kind of have uh, there's a fear factor there. So but to start off, what's your general approach uh, to seizures in the pediatric patient? So, yeah, it's um, I mean, you're exactly right that there's that there's a whole lot of similarities, right? There's a lot of crossover you know, between adult and, and pediatric. There's a couple of kind of unique considerations um, that play into pediatrics that, that I'm you know, hoping to talk about today. Um, the first things that I kind of think about when that when that pager goes off from our standpoint, you know, we we're receiving a page. Uh, from EMS, and we always appreciate the heads up. I think that's really great. Uh, appreciate uh, kind of knowing what what's coming our way. My very first thoughts, and I think the first thoughts when when you guys are called to to a scene, is okay. Seizure activity um, is the patient actively seizing or not? Is is the number one biggest question? Um, and then number two, I like to think of kind of categorize it as is a first time seizure or is this kind of a, a chronic you know, seizure, kind of recurrent event in a patient that has a known seizure disorder. Now, is this your thought process or is this yeah. information you'd like to have? This is bo both, okay. absolutely. And so, like, I certainly want to know, like, when, when the page goes off and it says, you know, 15-year-old seizure, I, I really, the big, big thing I'd like to know, and if, and if there's any way to get it across through dispatch to us, is, is, it, is it, are they actively seizing or was it a seizure event that kind of has, you know, resolved? Okay. Um, and so, so those are kind of my thoughts is, okay, I, this seizing or not um, actively, and then um, kind of the question that kind of comes to my head that we can certainly tease out when you get there, right? When the patient gets to us and when, when in, um, EMS gets to the scene even before that is, okay, is this an, is this a known seizure disorder um, versus is this something that's kind of a first time, kind of a surprise that uh, nobody was expecting? Does that change your game plan? Not, it changes the down the road, the acute management, it actually um, doesn't change it so much, which is a good thing that we can kind of treat them all the same. Um, but it's good information um, from your end EMS when you're collecting the information, it's good um, for you guys to have that if you're passing it on to us. And then we uh, potentially we end up talking to the pediatric neurology service, um, you know, down the road. And so it's good, good to have that information. A um, couple other things that come to pop into my head as well that um, I think we'll talk about a little bit. So febrile seizures, and if it's a toddler, mm -hmm. pseudo seizures, if it's a teenager, just kind of things that come to my head as I'm as I'm kind of mentally preparing for me to deal with the patient. And I think they're worthwhile for you know EMS providers as you 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 received a call and you're on your way to the scene. 
kind of some things to kind of keep in mind. Well, so can we do that? Like, let's say, let's say we do get called out, right? We know we're having a pediatric seizure and I'm on, I'm in route to the scene. What should I be thinking? I, I, exactly that. I think that this is, 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 is this going to be the first, is this the first time or is this a chronic one um, that kind of prepares you for how the parents are going to respond and how the family is going to respond, I think, in a big way. Is, gotcha. So um, if it's chronic, I'm assuming they've seen this before. The, Maybe they're yeah, a little more calm. They, and they're a little more calm. They sometimes know more about the disease than I do, I, I think, you know, sometimes when we get in there. Um, and then the other things are just going to be uh, a lot of what you, a lot of what you already do. I think that the uh, you know, assessment of the scene, um, ABCs is still your number one thing. Or I, I will, I guess I'll back that up and say that's probably one, one B. We all do a, an element of physical exam um, before ABCs when we arrive on the scene because we're looking at the patient. Just visually, Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. Yes, exactly that. So we, um, unless you arrive on the scene and immediately close your eyes or walk backwards into the end of the house, do a visual yeah, you are looking and seeing, is the patient awake and alert? Right. Are they responsive or not? And then obviously, um, for seizures, are they actively seizing or not? So that's your, that's your kind of your, your true primary assessment. We do that automatically. That's not something that we need to remember. And so, um, so doing that, and then the next in line is going to be your ABCs. Um, for seizure activity, um, airway and breathing. Um, frequently you can manage that with just kind of the basic, you know, in my mind, the kind of the big four, sure. um, you know, you go ahead and throw some oxygen on. Um, positioning is, is big in all patients. Mm -hmm. um, it's really big in pediatrics, especially the littler kids have a, uh, they have a bigger head relative to the size of their body. And so that tends to push their neck forward and that can create a little bit of- Occlusion. Um, yeah, exactly, occlusion yeah. of the airway. And so just doing the positioning, head tilt, chin lift, a little bit of jaw thrust if you need to on smaller kids putting a towel behind the shoulders and that kind of makes their gotcha. head in a straighter plane. Mm -hmm. um, so the positioning um, and then just having your, what you, you guys, you don't need me to tell you this, but having your bag valve mask sure. and your suctioning available. Um, most kids with seizures don't need to be intubated. Um, and it's not something that's according to all the guidelines. It's not uh, generally recommended. It's not uh, something usually is required. In most cases, you're able to oxygenate and ventilate the patient just fine until you get them to the hospital. Gotcha. Okay, so <clears throat> those are kind of our, our first, our ABC assessment, right? Now we're going to move into, I guess, the uh, drug therapy. Yes, right? yeah. So what's, what's my first consideration there? So the big things are, uh, I mean, you've done your ABCs, and now we're literally, we're the very, very next step, I don't want uh, you, um, everyone to kind of feel like they need to mess around with lots of stuff, um, is just to stop the seizure, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the... There's kind of a few different approaches to this. Um, the standard uh, that the nationally most most pediatric emergency departments have kind of adopted their own protocols. I think every, every EMS units have your own protocols. Absolutely, protocol. yeah. And I wanted and, to point that out to the audience. Be sure, though, guys, we're having this conversation, but this is going to be based on our local protocols here in Bernalillo County, New Mexico. So. Uh, observe whatever your local protocols are. Go ahead, doctor. Absolutely, yeah. Um, one of the, the kind of nationally, the, the common trend is generally to give um, two doses of, of benzodiazepines as your first line therapy. Um, they are effective. They're generally very safe uh, medications. Um, we tend to start with Ativan. It uh, has a, uh, it, it's again, just safe and effective. It has a little bit less compared relative to the other benzodiazepines, a little bit less of a, of a dose stacking effect that could cause the respiratory depression that we worry about when, okay. we, when we start giving lots of benzodiazepines. Okay. Um, the, uh, we then tend to follow that up with, uh, you kind of have your choice uh, with second line. Um, it, for us, uh, Keppra has kind of moved into there. It's just a really well-tolerated medicine. A lot of patients are already on it as daily therapy. And right. any, anytime we can give a medicine that I know you do not have an allergy to, um, or you're not gonna have a negative reaction to, I like to do that. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll tend to start with you know, 0.1 milligrams per kilogram of the Ativan, give two doses of that, and then move on to Keppra. Um, the recent change uh, from a hospital standpoint is kind of the bump up. It used to be 20 milligrams per kilogram, and now that's uh, been uh, increased to, depending on the place, either 40 or 50 or 60 uh, milligrams per kilogram. And what is that just based on? Like Keppra load. Yeah, but I, I guess I'm asking, like, is that based on something empirical? Like, now this is the therapeutic dose or we were given too little before we were we were giving essentially what people were giving is they were giving the dose for prophylaxis uh -huh. and so 20 milligrams per kilogram is very good in patients who come in with a brain bleed and are not actively seizing and we want to prevent it um for active seizures we want to get the blood levels um up higher okay. and so that's the move more recently towards that i just kind of tell people 50 per kilo because some places say 40 some places play 60 i gotcha. think i think we do officially 50 per kilo at, gotcha. least at so, unm and then so and then 
we shouldn't wait until we have IV access. Right. Yeah, that's a really big point. And so there's a lot of um, if you if you're confident in your ability to get that IV, by all means get get rolling on it. And Adamant is a wonderful medication. You can also give diazepam through an IV. Uh, but there's a lot of physicians um, now that will tell you that um, you know don't you don't have to wait to to get an IV. And so um, uh, Versed is also an excellent medication, right sure. in that same benzodiazepine class. Um, and it's dosed uh, consistently, whether you give it um, buccal route, like kind of inside the cheek of the mm -hmm. patient, or intranasal, or um, intramuscularly. It's a 0 0.2 milligrams per kilogram. Mm -hmm. And the studies have shown that all three of those routes are efficacious in stopping seizures, and they're safe ways to deliver the medicine. And especially when you're on scene and you're and you're not certain about your ability to maybe get the IV, sure, uh, by all means. So uh, it could be difficult. Know, I mean, some of those little kids. It, it would be. I know if I was the one, I'll tell you that I would be the last person about. I would. We may be more useful having the uh, handing the stuff off to the mom and having her give it a try. So right? I definitely have all. The, whenever whenever EMS comes in and says they had a hard time getting an, an IV, I am the first person that has all the sympathy. So we appreciate that. Um. <laughs> and then if we're if we're given two doses, how long am I waiting? Um, from my first to my second dose. Yeah, about five minutes is okay. kind of the standard, and the reason being I, that that seems it's going to seem like forever, right? And yeah. I've I've been seems there. Like a long time. Yeah, I've been in there in the emergency room, um, and I can imagine it's probably even more chaotic at the scene. But in the emergency room, where we have a patient where we've given the dose and they are still seizing, and five minutes seems like forever, and everybody in the room is kind of looking at at, at you know at me like, when are we going to do this? When are we going to do this? Um, the studies have shown that if you give it the five minutes, um, the Overwhelmingly, the first dose of the benzodiazepine in patients who um, are otherwise ha you know, healthy and don't have any other like significant comorbidities, it's able to stop the seizure. We want to avoid the dose stacking. Benzodiazepines, um, as, as you know, like obviously respiratory depression is a big deal. And um, if you can avoid having to, to need to intubate the patient, you know, mm -hmm. then obviously that's a big step. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the kind of consensus among all the experts on this is that it is it is worth it to wait the five minutes. It's safe. You're going to be able to. It's that's effective. The key, right? Yes, absolutely. You're being. You're giving both safe and effective care. Okay. Because so, I think sometimes if a patient's actively seizing, it looks chaotic, right? It looks unsafe, and people would be standing around saying, "Do something." Yes, you know, absolutely. It, we're waiting for the medication yes. to take effect. Yeah, absolutely. And that and that five minutes, I would say, once you've given the first dose, that's the really good time. Um, and we'll, we'll get into this, but to, to, to kind of then start asking your questions, your, you know, your, your, your very brief, very focused history oh, and history. physical exam. Gotcha. I think now you've bought yourself some time, right? Mm -hmm. We always definitely say, and I think, I think um, you guys do this probably more than I do, but have that second dose drawn up and ready to go. So mm -hmm. at the three minute mark, everyone's kind of saying, okay, you know, here's the second dose. We're, we're going to give it at five. Um, everybody on board with this. Yes, we gotcha. are. Um, but definitely you know, use those, use that time, um, which I know uh, EMS units on scene, uh, that's your specialty, right, is, is, is sure. using your time to the best of, uh, of to accomplish what you need to do. Well, you know, and you just brought a question to my mind because it, I, we'll talk about it, but that seems obvious for like a tonic-clonic seizure, right? But I know there's so many different kinds. Um, what if it's not so obvious? That is where it becomes a little more, a little more tricky and a little more nuanced. Um, the doses that we're giving of, of our medicines, uh, we would probably say go ahead and give. You know, these are like non-toxic doses, right, of Ativan and, and uh, Diazepam and, and Versed. And so if you feel like, boy, I'm not really certain, um, you know, subclinical seizures is definitely a thing, right, where they're exactly that, where they're not tonic-clonic seizing. Abs absence seizure? Um, absence seizures certainly happen. Absence, is that the right way uh, to that's, say that's it? That's the fancy, I've been saying it wrong that's the fancy way to say it. Okay. Yes, all absence. Right. Yes. I'll correct yeah. that. <laughs> um, all right, so... I, that's a good segue. You brought up uh, history and the physical exam. Um, so focus history, physical exam. Now we can pretty much put this together and ask the parent or, or guardians, you know, is this chronic, right? Has this patient ever happened before to this patient? Or if they say, no, it's never happened before. Well, tell me about the last 24 to 48 hours. Yes. Yeah, right? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Absolutely. Exactly that. So it's really, it's, it's, if it's a first onset, that's, that's relatively straightforward. The word that, that neurology always wants to, they always ask us and they always want to hear about is provoked. And so exactly what you said, what's going on, fever, current illness, um, you know, in smaller kids or, or frankly, teenagers, any possible toxic ingestions that have been going on, you know, either in little kids, obviously accidental and teenagers, re recreational stuff or, um, you know, obviously suicide attempts and things like that. Um, and then any recent history of trauma, that's a big one, okay. you know, obviously within the past 24 hours, if you've had a blow so to the head. that's going to be part of my physical exam. Yeah, absolutely. any signs of that, right? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. The, 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 the history part of it and then physical exam, definitely looking for in the smaller kids, obviously signs of 
um, non-accidental trauma is is a big thing as well. Gotcha. And, and so like bruising or hematoma of the head, um, obviously un, you know unequal pupils okay. um, is is worrisome for some sort of abusive head trauma. So we want to take the time to do a focused physical exam uh, for these patients. You do, and and it's a big deal. And we're and we we're going to ask you lots of questions. I hope we don't. We don't ask uh, too many because this is focused, right? I think sometimes I've seen sometimes the doctors are asking all these like really detailed questions of EMS and I want to kind of step in and be like, that's, that's not their job, <laughs> right? To ask that, right? That's, that's, but just, you do want to have at least some basic details. But it's a it good does, point you bring that up because for us, it's important for us to understand continuation of care, right? You yes. Know, uh, what's what's headed? What's next for this patient when they get yes. to the hospital? Yep. And we can kind of start setting that up. Right? Absolutely. And uh, you guys, you guys are the ones who set the table with this. With the the story is such a big deal. The you know the length of time. I mean the obvious stuff, right? The length of time. How many seizures were? Seems there? obvious, but I'm glad we're having this conversation <laughs> because in the heat of the moment we forget, right? And like right. I said, when it's peds, the stakes are much higher. Uh, whether yeah. whether that's a perception or a reality, but you know things move faster, and we kind of. Uh, we can overlook and skip some steps. Um, so if it's a known disorder, um, we want to ask about compliance, right? Maybe we missed a dose. Big deal. And there's there's several questions. There's several questions that I think need to be asked. Okay. Um, the, the family is usually very good at, at again, knowing the details. Um, a lot of the times so these are kind of chronic seizure kids and the families know them really well. Um, yeah, absolutely that. So if they've, if, have they missed some doses and sometimes the parents say, no, no, no. But then you look at the teenager, especially, and it's their job to give themselves the medicine and they're like, uh, maybe not. Or, I mean, maybe they ran out. Um, vomiting is another big key is, is maybe they're taking it physically. And then if they're vomiting, why they're not keeping it down. Um, and so there's, there's, uh, any number of different ways. A couple of other, uh, points I think that are worth, uh, mentioning in these kids that are chronic is occasionally neurology will actually be weaning them off of medicine. So mm -hmm. when they get a little bit older, um, frequently they'll, or, you know, they'll be changing something, maybe moving to something that has less side effects or, um, or they're seeing, seeing, you know, it's, Hey, it's been five years since you had a seizure. Let's, let's see how you do. Right. And so, um, any recent changes in the dose uh, along with any missed doses. And then another one is that even in the most perfectly compliant patients and the perf most perfectly compliant families, mm -hmm. um, if they haven't had a seizure in a while, they're probably taking the exact same dose. You know, now you have a 12 year old and they're on the same dose oh, as when they were an eight year old. Right. Okay. And so the, uh, you know, just the weight based dosing of these medications makes it so that they can get to sub therapeutic levels, even if the family's doing everything right. Sure. Um, and so these are all kind of really good questions to, to ask. And we'll, we'll certainly ask them again in, in the hospital, but it, um, uh, EMS really does a good job of kind of setting the table for us is to kind of like, Hey, here's what, here's what we're dealing with. Gotcha. Um, and that's certainly very helpful in kind of moving, moving the evaluation forward in the ED, kind of having that information. And then we want to ask like, you know, if they're having seizures daily, how many, or if it's daily, right? How Absolutely. Often? Yeah. And, and sometimes you'll, you'll get that, uh, some of these you know, chronic disorders, um, you, uh, you're like, oh, when was the last time they seized? And they're like, oh, no, they, they seize like 20 times a day, you know? And that's and that might be their baseline. Mm -hmm. And frequently the patients that seize a lot, they're very, very small. They're like 10 seconds. They don't become hypoxic. It does, it's not causing um, any like acute brain injury in the moment. And so um, neurology still gives medicines. There's um, that, that kind of goes down a whole new uh, rabbit hole of, of different medications. And uh, then you're on a you know, ketogenic diet and, and vagal nerve stimulators and a lot of other complicated stuff. Um, the... Uh, but the main, the main questions just to kind of ask is exactly that is like, is this, is this to kind of establish, Hey, they have lots of seizures and then really, really, really specifically, really, really, really helpful is, um, asking them essentially like, why, do, why did you, so if this is, if you have a chronic seizure disorder, that's what, why did you call EMS? What's different right? about yes. this one, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. That's what I was going to yeah. ask. So if yeah. you're accustomed to this happens 20 times a day. Why did you call yeah. now? What's different? Yeah, exactly that. And that's a big, big deal. And that that information, uh, like we said, you'll relay that to us. And we, of course, uh, talk to the families a little bit about it. And then frequently when we're talking about medications, um, dosing, and when we're talking about with pediatric neurology, does this patient need to be admitted? Do we need to do a bunch of studies? That is like the number one question is for these chronic kids is what's different? Yeah, what, what's different about this? Does what the do you seizure typically hear what, like in those instances? The, frequently that the seizure looked different. You know, the family usually will kind of know what the seizure um, looked like. And um, a big one that would be very worrisome is is if a patient who normally has generalized seizures, now he's having like a focal seizure, you know. So normally he has shaking of all four extremities, the eyes roll back in the head. But now this time it's just his arm kind of shaking or something mm. like that. Um, that's a little worrisome. And that might trigger you to do a little more like maybe some head imaging, yeah, maybe yeah. repeat an EEG because mm -hmm. the nature of your uh, seizure disorder might have changed. So, Interesting. Okay. Uh, so... <clears throat> From the standpoint uh, of an EMS provider, 
Um, and we're talking about managing seizures in patients that have a, a chronic disorder. Um, you mentioned these are weight-based, right? Yes, so yeah, frequently. So would something like, well, you yeah, and as a person ages, would weight gain affect the efficacy of their medication? So let's say, oh, you put on 20 pounds in the past two months, and all of a sudden he's seizing more often. Is that is that? That would be right at the top of the list wow. for us. Yeah. And when, when we talk with, talk with the neurology team, they frequently say, okay, that's, that's what we're doing. We'll, we'll redo some calculations. Um, and, you know, we, the idea for, for any medication really, but, uh, you know, especially for these seizure medications, any medicine's going to have some negative side effects. And so you always want to dial it into just that dose that's going to get you to a therapeutic level, but not too much more. And so um, as long as uh, patients are controlled, neurology doesn't want to go, you know, they don't dial it up, actually. And a lot of patients end up, you know, they stay on that that eight-year-old dose for a long time and they do fine. Or like we kind of mentioned previously, they're able to wean off in some cases. Well, let's say something like Keppra. What would be a common side effect that patients might complain about? One of the more interesting about Keppra is it, it's, it is uh, very well tolerated from a physiologic standpoint, but it has uh, psychiatric side effects. Hmm. And um, uh, so the, the patients the patients who can take it and can do it with kind of minimal um, psychiatric side effects, um, it's a wonderful medication because it tends not to have a lot of the like sedating uh, problems that a lot thinking. of the medicines have. Yeah, yeah, Keppra tends to be a little bit better and it's one that we can load when you come into the ED. And so we really love having this, you know, this exact same medication that we can use both for your chronic seizures and for acute on chronic seizures. Um, but uh, a lot of some kids get kind of this hyperactivity and they become uh, parents describe them as just being like intolerable in the household. And so uh, the, you know, like it, almost it, manic it a little bit. Yes. Yeah. It sounds like it. And I've never witnessed it, but uh, I just families describing it are like, yeah, we we're not we're not doing Kepler. Don't give Kepler. <laughs> OK, so and I and I don't ever put up a fight in, in you know, the year 2021. We have enough options for, sure. you know, anti-epileptic drugs that we say, OK, well, let's, we've got five other classes to choose from. So let's figure something out. Well, that's an interesting point. The other point, too, I really wanted to emphasize because even for me, I really wasn't thinking about, yeah, as a person ages and their weight changes, this would affect the efficacy. So I think that's a, an important point um, <clears throat> that you brought out. So um, febrile seizures. Yes. Can we talk a little bit about it? Absolutely. Right. Yeah, this is this is right in our the pediatric. This is like bread and butter uh, pediatric emergency medicine. All right. So common age. When, when typically would I see a febrile seizure? So the teaching, it, depending on who you ask, it's either five months to five years or six months to six years. So I have taken the pragmatic approach of telling people Four about to seven five, years. Yeah, five to six months to okay. five to six years. Okay. So um, and there's nothing there's nothing I, I've done a little older. I mean, just like with every medical condition, there's nothing that magically changes at your fifth or sixth birthday. You know, so it's a little bit older, but um, overwhelmingly they, they tend to be in toddlers. So the, the the real cluster cluster is 12 months to 18 months okay. where we see them overwhelmingly the most. Um, but but um, by and large, it's kind of within that uh, five to six months to five to six year range. And, and how can we it's impossible to predict. But what are yeah. what are some things that we'd be looking for? Like what would precipitate or provoke? Uh, febrile seizure. So one of the big ones actually is a, is a history, a family history of uh, febrile seizures. And we. Uh, but is this diagnostic of epilepsy? It no. And that would be the thing is that, is that uh, febrile seizures by definition are um, are outside of epilepsy. So we're saying that we we have excluded epilepsy based on history and physical exam and findings. I think there's a, a common perception that the two are related or Right, a febrile yeah. seizures predicting yeah, absolutely. future epilepsy. Yeah, but that's not correct. No, and so that's that is a really good. That's one of the things I make a point when when we're talking to the families about it is we say, so you've had a febrile seizure. Your your patient here has had a febrile seizure. Um, the one thing it does do is it puts you at an increased risk for another febrile seizure. And about about a third of kids will have another one. The younger you are, obviously, then you, then the larger the window um, to. Uh, you know, have another repeat event, right? Okay. Um, it 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 does not significantly increase. Depending on some studies, it, it, there's either no increase or it's only a slight increase in your risk of having epilepsy. And so I tell families that I say this is we are not a today in this moment we are definitely not diagnosing epilepsy. And B, the overwhelming likelihood is this this isn't epilepsy. You're not going to ever be diagnosed with epilepsy. And so I do think that's a big that's a big point is that literally it's we're we're uh, there's kind of a genetic predilection in some people, but there's something about the brain at that age where if you have a fever, it can um, it can spark a seizure event. It is a true seizure event, it's and it's very event. and it's very. I tell families like we're not we're not. Uh, you know, we're not trying to downplay this. It was scary. It's a real seizure, mm -hmm. um, but it's not an epilepsy disorder, thankfully. 
And so, and then, so, and I don't want to get too far off, but you have me uh, now. I have a million questions I want to ask you. <laughs> so, we mentioned fever. Give me a range, like how hot. Uh, the uh, official diagnostic criteria is thirty-eight. Thirty is kind of the cutoff point. All right. um, I will definitely say that we um, certainly. Uh, we've had times where where EMS arrives on the scene, the family reports a fever, you know, it's tactile fever, you know, grandma felt the forehead or something. Um, they gave Tylenol, temperature is now down, um, and we can still definitely count that as if, if everything else is very consistent, we have no evidence of epilepsy, then we definitely, we definitely take that, in pediatrics, we take that fairly seriously, the family reporting a history of fever. And some studies have shown that, that uh, you know, mothers and grandmas are, are, are pretty darn good at measuring out fevers. Um, and so the, the official, if, if we are measuring 38 is the temperature cutoff, um, but definitely a history of recent fever with the, with the, um, seizure event, um, still fits the diagnosis. Okay. So I get the call and I arrive on scene and mom says, he had the seizure it lasted two minutes. Baby's now looking around. I can tell he's post -tictal. What are my first actions? What am I doing first? So um, the the same standard stuff that you would do that I know you guys do is, is exactly that with your ABCs, okay. taking a peek, making sure that the kid is, he is indeed just postictal. One of the worrisome things that we always want you guys to keep in mind and what we need to always keep in mind is um, this is very rare nowadays in the era of vaccines, but something else that can present as fever and seizures is meningitis, right? Mm -hmm. And so that is bad news. Mm -hmm. And so and in younger kids, especially under the age of 12, we get really, really worked up about fevers um, for that reason, right? Is that they is that little kids don't manage um, bacterial infections uh, particularly well. And especially, I mean, nobody manages uh, meningitis particularly well, right? When it's when it's in your brain fluid. And so a rule out's going to be what, that sore neck, and the headache problem being, of course, in the smaller kids, they Can't don't, yeah, that. they don't communicate it. And actually they, because, you know, kids who have an open fontanelle, um, the stiff neck doesn't happen because Ooh. they can, they can just kind of expand. So, so you would maybe note a bulging fontanelle, um, but the, but you could, you could very easily move their neck around in a kid who has um, a, a very profound bacterial meningitis. Wow. Okay. So it may be, we may not be able to detect that. No, that's exactly it. And so a lot of the times when, when the kiddos um, end up being, being brought in to us, which I think is entirely appropriate because we don't necessarily end up doing a big seizure workup. Um, we, but we uh, frequently end up doing an infectious workup. Why do they have a fever? Why do they have such a high fever spike? Um, in little kids, especially little girls, like urinary tract infections or something that needs to be diagnosed and treated, right? They need a medicine for that. So um, we'd like to see them. And then obviously taking a peek again at things like meningitis and um, fever, seizure, and then post-ictal, um, can certainly, you know, a kiddo who's having meningitis is mm -hmm. going to have a fever, going to have a seizure and going to look sick and not super responsive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's really hard. I, I would, uh, I would essentially not ask you guys. I think that wouldn't be fair of us to say, why don't you figure that out, sort that out on this? Scene? Well, you know where this becomes kind of complicated is if we get there, a kid is postictal and mom says, you know what? I don't want him transported. I'm going to keep administering Tylenol and we'll see what happens. So it's good for us to know, you know what, mom, there may be something else going on. Yeah, it's, uh, that is what I would share with the mom. If I just like, let's say I happen to be on the scene or walking by or I was doing something like Dr. Pruitt does, you know, sure. or come out onto the scene. Mm -hmm. um, that is exactly what I would say. I'd be like, well, you know, we uh, the fever just didn't come from nowhere. And so even if we're calling this a febrile seizure, um, I like I like kind of where mom's head is at in that. She's like, oh, you know, febrile seizure. I know what this is and I'm not getting super worked up. But uh, still, uh, there's certainly a role to play in finding an infectious source um, of, of the fever and ruling out the serious stuff like meningitis. Okay. And then here, I just <clears throat> real quick, simple versus complex febrile seizure. Yeah. And the reason why this is important, we, we certainly don't expect um, EMS crews to come in and, and, and declare to us that well, this has been a simpler a complex, complex. Yeah. but, but I, I, I think it's worth knowing because we're, that's when we ask all these questions, we come running up and say, Oh, febrile seizure. And we're like, we ask all these questions. If you kind of look at the list, you're like, ah, this is why they're asking these questions. Gotcha. This is why they want to know. So if there's a single, so the simple, simple febrile seizure, that would be a single event within a 24 hour period. Okay. Um, it's generalized seizing and it lasts less than 15 minutes. Lasts less than 15 yes. minutes. And so if any, if, if any of those things, uh, if it, so if there's been more than one or it's focal or it lasts longer than 15 minutes, any one of those then puts it into the complex febrile seizure range. Um, that's much more rare. And you're saying an actual seizure 
lasting more than 15 minutes? Yes. Wow. Uh, man, yeah. I'm terrified. Yeah, I, that would be. I know. It's a, uh, you know, and it used to be that the, you didn't get to be called status epilepticus until it got to 30 minutes. I just always kind of, now it's five, which I think is a lot okay. more reasonable. <laughs> I think reasonable. the 30 minutes, I was like, that you really got to earn it to get status epilepticus. But yeah, it is. It's 15 minutes is the cutoff point. Yeah. And there's, there's some talk about moving that towards 10. So I think yeah. I think you'll see that in the near future um, where we kind of move it uh, down towards like 10 is kind of the cutoff point of this is this is something that needs to be looked into. Yeah. 15 minute seizure. Now, I'm just guessing, wouldn't that have long term effects in in most cases? No, children especially tend to uh, tend to compensate pretty well. Um, there's it's, it's worrisome enough that we would still that even if you arrived on the scene um, at something that you pers- that you were we're fairly certain it was a you know febrile seizure but they've been seizing for five minutes um you know go ahead and give them a benzo right so we sure. want we want those treatments on board within okay. five minutes um because my fear would be hypoxia right uh, indeed like yeah some type of yeah hypoxia absolutely hypoxia and, and then just your your um you know physiologically it's not great for your brain to have your neurotransmitters right. all firing all at one right, time and right. so um it's certainly worth treating and stopping um by and large um even kids who've had uh, complex febrile seizures these ones are longer than 15 minutes they tend to be, they are the ones who are a little bit of an increased risk for um, further epilepsy down the road or, or further neurodiagnostics. But overwhelmingly, they still tend to um, overwhelmingly do really well. That's good news. I'm glad yeah. to hear that. Okay. And then uh, here's a big one, Doc. Pseudo seizures. Now, yes. in, in the field, you know, what I was taught and what I thought I was looking at, pseudo seizures, somebody was faking it. That's what we used to call them. Yeah, it's not a seizure. That's a pseudo seizure. You know, um, maybe we have some patients that get uh, incarceritis, you know, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they try to lock them up at whatever they were called shoplifting. And all of a sudden there's uh-huh. a seizure. Uh-huh. Yep. But that's not accurate, is it? A pseudo seizure is not that. Uh, if, officially, no. There's okay. and I will I will certainly give you my I'll give you the official um, kind of stand and then I'll certainly put my little personal spin on it. Please. But you're absolutely right. So so pseudo seizure by definition. And in fact, they're kind of trying to move away from the pseudo seizure because I think we all we all, myself included definitely kind of think, of, oh, this person's faking a seizure. Um, so they're now they've cut they're, they're 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 calling it either psychogenic seizure or non epileptic seizure or psychogenic non epileptic seizure. And it is. Um, According to the to the to the designation, the way it's been categorized um, by the medical community is it's on this the same spectrum of conversion disorders, and so those by definition are involuntary, and, and it's essentially physical symptoms from a an emotional or psychiatric cause. Um, versus mm. the the what we think about like faking is like that's you know the factitious disorder or malingering like I don't I don't want to go to jail so I'm yes. going to fake a seizure yeah. right. Yeah. So I'm just going to, this isn't, you're not going to see this in any, written in any articles or anything like that, but I'll just put my personal opinion out there. Um, so officially we, 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 we're pseudo seizures again are involuntary. I will definitely say that teenagers especially are capable of faking seizures, right? So I think like with a lot of stuff that's psychiatric, I think there's a spectrum. I think there's absolutely kids who genuinely, truly, um, they have some sort of stressor or anxiety or depression or something like that. And it puts them into um, these, uh, you know, pseudo seizure events that, um, could very well be beyond their control. Um, I think the, the, I absolutely feel very much that I've seen, uh, patients who, uh, uh, didn't want to go to school or didn't like what was going on at home or something like that. And, and probably were deliberately faking a seizure. The good news, the really good news out of all of this is that, um, it doesn't really matter. You know, not, not only, not only does EMS not have to tease it out as far as how voluntary and voluntary it is, but we don't, we don't do it either. You so, don't do it either. so I, I try to, the big key I think is just to simply try to be non-judgmental. And I am, I have, I've dealt with enough teenagers as a doctor that I'm probably the most judgmental person that there is. You know, I've definitely <laughs> rolled my eyes at lots sure. and lots and lots of stuff. So, yeah. so this is, um, certainly, uh, I include myself in this when I say like, you know, trying not to be some, so judgmental. The, um, the li- you, you don't worry about the liability. What if you're wrong? The you don't do you don't do medication, right? You don't try not to. Yes. Yeah. And so and that's and that is why we try to use these um, the the um, standard of care is always what you try to follow. And the standard of care for pseudo seizures, you kind of go through your kind of little checklist here of uh, some items here that uh, that we're going to talk about. And if it definitely leans more towards um, towards pseudo seizure, you are OK with withholding medications. In the event that uh, that anything at any point along on lines doesn't doesn't kind of fit with the pseudo seizure picture, by all means, again, you know, especially a single dose of Ativan, for example, is a pretty benign thing. And frankly, if, if it's 
if they're having a pseudo seizure because of some life stressor or anxiety might, kind of thing, yeah, you, anyway. you might be therapeutic <laughs> anyways, right? You might be, you might be good for what ails them. So, so I certainly would, I will, I will promise you this. I will never, if you bring a kid into me and, and we end up diagnosing them with pseudo seizure, but you guys gave them a dose of Adamant, I promise you will never get an eye roll from me about that. Okay. I think that's entirely fine. Good to know. Um, I do think kind of, kind of what you were getting at these, uh, some of the things to kind of look at when we're kind of trying to tease this out. And these are, mm -hmm. these are documented in the literature, I think, which is so much better than just simply kind of like, you know, your mind, your gestalt. And yeah. I think this kid's fake, yeah. right? And yeah. we were all, we've all been teenagers before, right? Sure. So like, I, you know, I, I, I never kind of, the seizure, yeah, right? okay. yeah. I never did either. And, and uh, I kind of joked with some friends one day at work in, in the hospital. This is like, ah, I feel a seizure coming on. And then I thought, this might not be the place to do it. You might end up getting intubated by, uh, by one of your t friends or something, but sure. Um, so some of the things to kind of look for the, that, uh, that has been documented in the literature. So big things. So recent stressors, um, overwhelmingly, it tends to be female predominance. Um, it, it tends to be in teenagers and young adults. We definitely see it in males though. We definitely see it in, in all age ranges across the spectrum, but just a lot of things that are, uh, that it seems to be associated with tend to be things that we see also in the, in the female teenage population. So anxiety and depression, which again can affect, um, both sexes, um, uh, interestingly, there's some studies that show kind of PTSD. So, so recent stressors, but then also history of PTSD. And in, in teenage um, females, that tends to be sexual assault is um, kind of one of the things that we that we kind of see. There's obviously cultural factors. We, we definitely see that you know, folks from different cultures. Um, uh, pseudo seizure seems to be uh, more prominent in certain cultures around the world. Really? And then, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and then one of the big things that makes this so, 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 so hard is the population that probably gets diagnosed with pseudo seizure the most are people who actually have authentic, genuine seizure disorders. So you're getting called to the scene of a place and this kid, the kid takes Keppra. This kid has, has got seizures. We have EEGs that show this kid has seizure activity, right? And that makes it really, really hard to tease out. And so, um, again, it, when in doubt, uh, you're never going to have me. You'll never hear me complain so about it. Yeah, dose caution. of Adamant. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, I wouldn't... Um, you know, that would be poor form for, for EMS or for us in the ED for me to just kind of shake my head and be like, come on, kid. And then like, oh, wait a minute there. And for us, we're at a disadvantage because we only we have limited equipment and the, you know, our diagnostics are very limited. And there's a lot of liability, you know, yes. to make a claim and say he's faking it. Yeah. Um, you know, mm -hmm. so. Um, Absolutely. All right. And then so what else? Younger patients. There's some things, some notes I think you wanted to leave us about. Uh, leave us with uh, things we should consider. Yeah, a couple of things. So these, especially in your in your really little kids who are seizing, um, really, what I what I tell the residents, the really little kids who come in like newborns in the newborn period uh, for any reason, always remember these three things. So BGL, NAT, and sepsis. Okay. And then I would probably I probably would add once they get um, you know six months older, I would kind of add toxicology onto that list of things that are kind of you know this mysterious, hard to hard to um, exactly C, just it's not not obvious, not going to jump out to you, but these are things that can cause significant problems in the little kids. BGL, uh, you know, the blood glucose level, mm -hmm. um, I, right? Is, I would say that's the very next thing after you've you've given that initial dose. Mm -hmm. I would say your very next step would be to get that BGL. Wow. Um, the reason being is that, so hypoglycemia um, can absolutely cause seizures. It can definitely cause seizures in little kids. And they're seizures that won't respond to any of our anti-epileptic drugs. So the treatment for hypoglycemic seizures is to give that dextrose bolus. Um, the, it, it, the chemical pathways operate completely independently. And so you can give all the Ativan in the world and you're not stopping not that seizure. Stop yeah. Wow. So I would definitely work on work on getting it on board. Um, the, the, um, it's something that's relatively rare to be, to be like symptomatically, you know, the body does a pretty good job normally of managing glucose levels, even in little babies, as long as they're feeding well. Um, but definitely get that, get that BGL and, uh, cause that's definitely not something you want to be sitting on for a while where like, then, you know, we, we do the stick in the ED and we're like, oh, this, this kid's just, glucose right. is 21. Yeah. So. Yeah. That would be bad. Um, that's good to know. And that's something that will, um, definitely, uh, emphasize. And then. Here is a note about strange postictal presentations. What does that mean? Yeah, so one of these things that's really hard, and, we, and, and you kind of touched on this earlier, like so you've given your you've given your medicine, mm -hmm. and maybe the nature of what was happening has changed. Uh, maybe you know they were doing the kind of the standard tonic clonic generalized mm -hmm. shaking, and that has stopped. Okay, so so we we attribute a lot. Okay, postictal, right? So the yeah. postictal a from the seizure, b the medicines we gave. Mm -hmm. So we've got two kind of um, factors here. Um, but if you ever find that, that kids, you know, their, their heart rate is still really, really high or their blood pressure is still really high or they're not coming out of it, you know, like generally they should kind of progress in a way that like, okay, you know, we've been with this kid now for 15, 20 minutes. Why are they not waking up? Um, 
things to consider, um, you know, subclinical seizures, and that would be the seizures what, that are simply the, the wiring of the brain is, is going crazy, but it doesn't produce that shaking, doesn't produce the eye deviation. Subclinical seizures. Um, yes. Interesting. Um, and I've, we, we are certainly, um, we have some equipment now that's kind of new where we can put, a, uh, put just kind of a band around their head in the ED and um, see if they're seizing or not um, in real time, very, very quickly. And so for us, that's been very nice. And I, I'll just, I will openly admit that I've had a patient where um, exactly that EMS brought him in. They gave, they'd given a dose of Ativan. The patient had had generalized tonic-clonic seizing. That had stopped. Mom, mom knew the kid very well. This was a known kid with a, with a known seizure disorder. Um, and, and mom was just kind of calmly there. All of us were together and everything. And uh, so we said, okay, good. It's, it's stopped. You know, he's post-ictal. We put him on a little oxygen, put him in the room, get him on the cardiac monitor, the pulse oximeter, and we're watching him. And he, and um, nursing, I, I have to give them a lot of credit. They were just kind of like on it. Um, they were like, yeah, he, he's not waking up. He mm -hmm. is, he is still hypoxic and we're giving him some oxygen and there's no reason for us to, to need, you know, there's no respiratory thing. So we shouldn't need to be giving all these increasing, you know, amounts of oxygen. And so we put this uh, device on the head and um, it lit up and he was having subclinical seizures. And so we, we, of course, had then ended up having to give a lot more medicines. So that's certainly something to kind of keep in mind. Um, uh, most of the time with EMS, especially if you're responding around Albuquerque, your, your transit times are going to be short enough that um, you're going to give your doses anyway, right? You'll yes. give them the Ativan. And yep. so they're not going to be subclinical seizing um, in, for any significant length of time in your hands. Um, right. But it's something to kind of consider if you have a longer transport or you just kind of feel like, man, this is. Or I, even like the call we talked about where you, you get on scene. Mom said, oh, he had a seizure an hour ago. Uh, yes. You, you uh -huh. recognize like, oh, he's still post in a way that doesn't make uh -huh. sense. Yeah, if he's not returned to baseline and he, mm -hmm. he kind of should at least be making his way mm -hmm. there, yeah. getting back to baseline. Absolutely something to keep uh, keep in mind okay. for sure. Those are all really, really important uh, points. And I'm glad you brought uh, this information to us today. Um, that's about our time today. I'd like to thank everybody for uh, watching our podcast. And we'd like to thank uh, Dr. Gunderson uh, on behalf of AFR uh, for coming in. And uh, once again, we will uh, see you guys on the next one and stay safe.